Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the webinar on, on future of work and workers as part of a series on kitchen table webinars. Uh, uh, this is fifth in the series that we are organizing here at the Cody International Institute in collaboration with the Center for Employment Innovation at San Francisco Xavier University. Uh, in these webinars, we talk about uh, issues, opportunities, and challenges that re it relates to the future of work and, and future of workers. <clears throat> uh, let me uh, begin by first uh, uh, <clears throat> recognizing that uh, the San Francisco Xavier University is situated in Mi'kma'ki, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Let me also recognize that uh, people are joining uh, from different parts of the, of the world, and we also acknowledge the traditional caretakers and owners of those lands. We also recognize that today is, is Remembrance Day, uh, and, and once we start uh, the webinar, uh, today's webinar, we are actually going to take uh, a moment of silence at uh, 11 o'clock today. Uh, so I will, um, um, so we will all uh, pause and, and, and have a moment of uh, silence at that point in time. So I will indicate everybody when that moment uh, arrives. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to, to welcome uh, today's uh, speaker, uh, uh, Kolea Carrington. She is the executive director of Canadian Blockchain Consortium. And she's also the chief executive officer of Absolute uh, Combustion. Uh, so Kolia actually has a has a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, she's going to begin with that. Uh, it's about uh, forty minutes, where we will actually unpack uh, blockchain and 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 we, it's, it's a very basic introduction to to blockchain. And then we will have uh, about twenty minutes um, uh, to talk to Kolia. So what I will request that you have your mics uh, uh, switched off the whole duration uh, for 40 minutes, have your question coming in uh, in the chat box. We will collate those questions and, and ask Kolea once her presentation is over. So over to you, Kolea. Uh, can you, can you, <clears throat> are you able to share your screen? Can you see my screen? Absolutely, and I can hear you as well. Over to you, Kolea. Thank you so much once again. Wonderful. Well, hi, everyone. Um, really excited to be teaching this class today. I hope you guys find it informative. Um, I'm going to be lecturing on this for about, say, 40 minutes, and then we'll have lots of time for any questions that you may have. Uh, so this is um, our Canadian Blockchain Consortium's like Blockchain for Business, kind of Blockchain 101, but it really breaks it down. Um, a little bit about our consortium. So we've been going since about 2017 now. Oh gosh, sorry. Sometimes this thing just moves forward on me. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I might have to keep it in this mode. Um, so we've been going since about 2017 now. Mainly we're an education group. Uh, we focus on advocacy. We focus on events, marketing. Um, business development and helping companies understand the application potential of blockchain, um, whether it does fit in their business or even most importantly, if it doesn't fit into their business, just helping them have a really solid understanding of what the technology actually is. So in this class, a little bit of our learning overview, we're going to go into a bit of an introduction on blockchain, just so people can have an understanding. We're going to go very high level. I'm not going to get right into the weeds um, on this from a technical perspective. We're going to talk a little bit about the challenges to the business growth in terms of blockchain, some of the applications and sectors that you can get into with it, um, a bunch of industry case studies, because I find that when people have a deeper understanding of where it's actually currently being used, um, it helps with their knowledge of the technology, some of the op op opportunities and obstacles, and then some of the future developments um, that are coming. So in our introductions to blockchain, so what is blockchain? And for those of you who've already uh, spent the last little bit going through this, my apologies on the redundancy, but for those of you who are just joining, this may be helpful. So basically what it is, is it's considered like a digital ledger database, and it has very specific pieces of information that are time stamped and managed by a cluster of computers that are decentralized. So I'm gonna to explain decentralized just a little bit. And to do that, I'm going to explain centralized. So if you're going to work with an organization, say like Royal Bank, Royal Bank is going to have um, their own server and they're going to have complete control of that server and they're going to be the only ones able to access that server. If it's decentralized, it would mean that not only Royal Bank would access that server, but say anybody would be able to see 
that data. Anyone would be able to take a copy and record of that data. If it's decentralized, ownership of, the, of that data is basically completely public. Um, these blocks of data are secured and bound using something called cryptography. If you've never heard of cryptography before, you may have heard of encryption. It's kind of like that thing that keeps your cell phone safe. The reason why you're able to access your data via like a password. The technology behind that, that security is actually cryptography. So um, they can be public blockchains. So again, like decentralized, something like Bitcoin's blockchain is very public. Anyone is able to access that. Anyone is able to download the entire transactional history of uh, that Bitcoin blockchain, or they can be private and require permission. So it just depends on how the company has set their, their blockchain up. And what runs them is nodes or basically like computers or servers. So a node is going to run um, the blockchain. They are going to be able to keep it secure using cryptography. Um, a good explanation of that one would be say Bitcoin's blockchain. What they use to secure this cryptography, but what happens is their, their, their computers are solving very complex equations. And when they solve those equations, they basically mine a block stream of that data a unique digital fingerprint that's called a hash gets secured into that block of data and is, and is connected to every single subsequent block of that data. So if there, anything gets altered, it basically, it'll let you know exactly what happened and where it got altered uh, in that block set of data. So we've spoken about de uh, decentralized. Now in terms of immutable, cryptography is a very, very secure form of digital security. No alterations can be made to a blockchain without uh, it leaving a record. So in terms of say like, again, Bitcoin's blockchain, you can't change it no matter what you do. There's absolutely no ability to change any of the data that's into that blockchain. If you have a permission-based blockchain or, or privatized blockchain, you can alter records within the data, but it will show exactly who altered it and at what time it was altered and then transparent. The nice thing about blockchains is the contents of that database are shared with you know, all the parties that are given access. So it's either decentralized and everyone gets access or whoever you're sharing that data with all have access to that same information, uh, which creates kind of like a trustless system. So I like to say the business value of blockchain is in the three Ts, traceability, transactions, and trustlessness. So in terms of traceability, and we're gonna get into some case studies that showcase um, how it works for traceability, but basically any piece of information on that blockchain database, you're able to trace back to either the physical or origin of that object, the provenance. Um, you can have a surety of knowing where that product came from. It's really great if you're looking into agriculture, supply chain, luxury goods, knowing exactly where your good came from. And um, that way you'll know if it's actually a true, you know, if it is what it says it is. In terms of transactions, uh, smart contracts are one of the uh, positive use cases towards blockchain, and they are basically pre-programmed self-executing agreements that are based on um, business logic, and they help to resolve costly disputes. Uh, an example of that would be, say, company A would like to pay you know, company B for a product or service. Company B proves that they um, executed on that product or service or they delivered it. Company A automatically releases the funds for it. And all that can be done in the background without the uh, two individuals having to interact with it. They can prove that on the blockchain. And then trustlessness. So basically, you don't need to trust the party. It eliminates the need for it. You all have access to the same set of data and information. Right? So you don't have to worry if they're you know, telling you the truth, you can go look straight at the data and you can prove it. Um, so in terms of um, early adoption, so blockchain technology, a lot of people have heard the buzzword, oh, Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrency, things like that. It did come out around, the white paper for it was dropped around 2009. Um, so blockchain was the underlying kind of protocol that was running Bitcoin network people started looking at blockchain saying, hey, there's a lot more use cases here than just in the financial sector. And we've seen a lot of adoption. So about 95% of companies, and this is based on a Deloitte survey, 
are currently looking at exploring like blockchain, a lot of the big Fortune 500s. Um, about 34% are actively enrolled in trying to deploy it. Those companies mainly sit in the finance or uh, in that supply chain uh, kind of sector. And a lot of really interesting uh, consortiums have come out from it. So 74% uh, of, um, of the people that were surveyed in Deloitte's executive uh, study so they saw a really compelling case for blockchain to be used. So it's the kind of technology that's getting attention, very similar to how um, IoT got it about 20 years ago, how machine learning was a buzzword, you know, a good five years ago. Blockchain is kind of like that new technology buzzword that people are starting to pay some strong attention to. So let's discuss what some of the challenges for business growth could be in this. What are some of that systematic, um, sorry, systemic, economic, um, regulatory factors? So economic headwinds are definitely a big one. Um, all economic sectors um, must be digital sectors. So the CEO of Cisco, I believe, he came out with a statement that said, in the next 10 years, 40% of businesses are no longer going to exist if they fail to adopt to digital technologies. And if you think about our traditional sectors, that means a lot more businesses are going to go out. And because technology isn't going anywhere and its adoption is quite critical. Canada actually lags around uh, behind most of the world, especially Asia, Europe, even the United States, just in digital technology usage, let alone adoption. And we have a high regard in our country for being considered a very safe, um, very prosperous jurisdiction. Although interestingly enough, we've dropped on the standard of living from, the, um, from being like third in the world and it just keeps going down, unfortunately. But we do have a very high standard of living compared to uh, a fair few countries. We have very strong um, environmental regulations. We have a very dominant resource sector and energy. But this declining GDP growth and the slowing productivity that we're seeing are um, ways in which our countries are very high cost uh, of doing business is starting to manifest. So we have a declining GDP and high cost of doing business. So technologies like blockchain, they offer solutions to some of these pressing business issues. Um, according to the Government of Canada's digital strategy, it tables that digitization of, tr of traditional technologies like agriculture, oil and gas and manufacturing, it's a very core priority. Um, there was one study I saw that said that blockchain could cut uh, costs in the energy sector um, as high as 6%, which actually would equal like close to a like a billion dollars in creating efficiencies, which is pretty fascinating. So one of the ways that blockchain is really, uh, can be very supportive for our country is in things like trade disputes. So if you guys remember back in 2019, China was no longer willing to accept our pork and even our beef products for a while. And the problem was there was an issue with the validity uh, of some of the um, veterinary records for our, our pork products. They, they were chosen, Shown to be fraudulent. Mm -hmm. So how um, something like blockchain can actually support something like that is you can tag like the ear of that pig, you can tag it with an IoT sensor and you can actually put all of that data up into an immutable ledger database, which would be a blockchain. And everything that happened uh, through that pig that can basically be tracked on blockchain. So where it was born, what it was fed, its veterinary records, everything like that can get scanned, put up into the blockchain. So if you're going to ship this pork product after it's been processed from here to say like China, they can show complete provenance, they can show complete um, medical records, they can see if anything was altered in it and therefore creating better trust from our country as we're exporting uh, goods or you know, services abroad. So. Um, its ability to in instantly track just about anything to their origin point and show that unbroken, unaltered chain of custody, it's a prime area where this technology will um, show great benefit. So let's talk about a couple of the applications and sectors that we can get into. Blockchain is very diverse. I know a lot of people kind of see this technology and think it's, a com it's an industry completely on its own. Um, it's not. It's, it works in many, many industries and many, many applications. It just depends on if the business, um, if an individual business makes sense to actually adopt this technology. So manufacturing is a great one. Uh, agriculture, financial services, real estate, legal, oil and gas governments, energy distribution. Now, one of the reasons why it makes sense for all of these, so let's just look at something like man manufacturing, agriculture, um, say like oil and gas, what would all these have in common? 
almost everything here has to do with the supply chain. Everything has a value chain of goods that they require to operate their business. In manufacturing, you're looking at what happened to this like cog or widget all the way from, you know, when it was a piece of metal, it's now getting machined. It now has to get turned into a widget and it's getting tracked all the way through to the person who's like buying and installing that widget. I'm in agriculture, uh, we've just talked about it, but say an example would be like birth to burger. You're trying to show from where this animal was born all the way to you know when it became um, a piece of produce for someone to purchase. Uh, same in oil and gas from you know doing it like in situ or once through steam generation, getting that product out of the ground and transporting it all the way down to the refinery, all the way through to the gas pump. All of that is managed and tracked via a supply chain. And you, if you want to know exactly where your goods are, where your goods came from, where your goods have been, different things like that, all of that has value um, on a blockchain. Being able to show complete transparency, being able to create trustlessness with your um, end product. Now in the legal accounting, say government, even real estate applications, this is where smart contracts, those pre-programmed existing agreements that are based on like business logic come into play. So instead of having to go to a lawyer specifically and have him draft up a contract or an agreement, you can have like a pre-programmed contract that's put into the blockchain that self-executes once each counterparty confirms that, you know, a certain set of verified work has been done. Um, in terms of real estate, being able to transfer titles uh, with better ease is great. If you look at, say, an example for this, a third world country, there's parts um, in Africa right now where it they only process maybe 200 land titles a year like the level of slowness on that is is pretty epic because they don't have the infrastructure to be able to speed this process along but what happens if say i own um my own small home on a piece of land but i'm generationally have been on this exact same land say seven generations i'm not going to have a piece of paper i'm not going to have a title that says yes i have ownership to this land I can only, you know, go to the land titles and say, hi, I've been here for so many years this is how many generations that we've been. They can see the birth records in that location. They can issue them a title. What's happening in parts of the world right now is that say um, thieves, burglars, whatever you want to call it, malicious individuals are coming in, kicking people off of that land and claiming it on their own as if it's a squatter's right. And these people have no way of disputing it because they have no prior claim. So there was a part of Africa, um, a small country there who actually put together a bit of a pilot and they were able to fast track and push through 500 land titles within that same period of time where it normally takes them 200. So being able to create that um, proof of ownership is a really good application uh, for blockchain as well. So again, this, this kind of technology can go just about anywhere, which is fantastic. Um, in many different industry sectors, it has a value add for all of them. The biggest one is if you're an individual company, you likely really do not need blockchain. So if you're one business standing alone, um, you don't have a lot to do with supply chain, you really don't need it. So even if you're a restaurant owner, where you would want it is if you are trying to share information and coordinate with multiple different counterparties that all have to agree to the same set of facts. So if you're in manufacturing and say you're an oil and gas company, but you're dealing with 150 different vendors, you want that 150 different vendors, to, you want to be able to access that information without having to go to each one individually. So getting them to share particular sets of information to create a stronger value chain or being able to trace back a product quicker, that's where you would see a better value to something like a blockchain for, for a business. You need to be a very large kind of multinational company um, for that, or you need to be a cluster of companies coming together to say, to try and share data. If you're an individual business, it's very likely that you just need to look at how to update, update your database. Um, if you're using still manual paper entry for things that is antiquated and looking at something, even sharing like a Google Docs would be an upgrade uh, to your database and something like that. So um, we've talked about this, but just to reinforce the learning, the different application types. So um, the DLT, distributed, distributed Ledger Technologies or Database, it's kind of that foundation of the business blockchain. Again, it's a database that can be shared with, um, with networks. It can help to remove redundancies. It can help to streamline data processing. 
Um, one of the reasons for this is say if you are doing that manual data entry and you have that person like you know, writing that data or trying to input that data after it's been written, human error is usually one of the biggest cost factors to any business. So if you're inputting that data incorrectly, then you're going to have to, there's going to be kind of like a break in that supply chain. There's going to be inaccurate data that's being given into this company. If it's automatically put through um, digitally via computer, there's less likelihood for human error. You know, say it's like a Friday, you're like, oh, I don't want to be here. Data goes in incorrectly, and then you know the business isn't sharing accurate information. Smart contracts. So again, blockchain applications that enable self self executing agreements between parties based on pre programmed business logic, where um, all you have to do is the, for the transaction to agree on terms, and the smart contract can execute as long as the parameters are being met with based on the information in that database. The third one we haven't talked about as much uh, is that tokenization. So where a lot of people hear about cryptocurrency, um, this is probably one of my least favorite applications into blockchain, mainly because of the negative uh, impression it's created on from a global society. But a token, um, it's a blockchain based way of turning an asset, whether it's either physical or it's virtual into something kind of fractionized, traceable, um, or considered more liquid. A lot of people like to consider like you're putting real estate on you no know, blockchain with a token, it's more liquid. Someone can transfer those tokens and, and share that value. Um, the issue that we have with it is most tokens, uh, most ICOs, most cryptocurrency coins out there are illegal securities offerings. Um, we can, I don't know if you guys are gonna get into this in another class, but Basically, it just means that people have publicly crowdfunded in a manner that is not approved by the Securities Commission. So being very mindful if you're interested in um, you know, blockchain and the cryptocurrency sector and you're interested in doing a token, you want to make sure that you're following through with all securities regulation, how things work, uh, how you're taking custody, different things like that, because uh, the way it's been done, especially in 2017, was very highly illegal and created a very negative impression on the technology. So um, in terms of application and sectors, we're going to get into this one. And so how blockchain um, enables supply chain. So as you can see on the little graphic in front of you, where it uh, shows that number one, where you're kind of looking at like a little bit of a warehouse and then like a brick and mortar store. So this would be kind of like that private internal. Um, so if you are... Um, uh, let's just say a skincare, um, you're, you're in your spa, right? And you deal with a lot of skincare. Say your distribution house um, has a massive store of it and you have to supply it to all of, your, all of your spas. This could make sense for you if you're looking for that traceability, being able to figure out, you know, did some of our product go missing? Where did it go missing? If you're looking for it to be extended, uh, including adjacent players, so this would be more of a permission-based restricted blockchain where you're sharing only specific sets of data. So I also wanna be uh, clear, sorry, when it comes to um, permission-based blockchains, you can choose what data you share. So it doesn't mean you're sharing everything to do with your company, you're sharing specific sets of data that enable another counterparty to be able to work with you and share, and share exactly what it is both of you wanna share. Uh, so this is a, you're adding in logistics, um, going to a distribution um, warehouse that's going to a brick and mortar store. And then in terms of the entire end-to-end -end supply chain, where this makes sense for like, say, an organization like Walmart. Walmart is that brick and mortar store, but they have to deal with distribution warehouses. They have to deal with logistics. Um, there could be additional distribution uh, locations uh, besides that. There's could be in terms of meat, you're having, you know, where it's being packaged and processed all the way down to the farm and then all the way to the person who purchases the groceries. There, you know, there's um, some sentiment where people are like, they'd like to, you know, use their phone, scan a QR code on a piece of, you know, produce, say it's like a piece of beef. They could scan with that QR code and see the entire transaction history, everything from right down to where that cow came from to is it really been grass fed to when was it actually butchered. Um, and I'll, I'll talk in one of the case studies about an app that's been working on just that. So this kind of shows you the entire value end to end of it. If you wanna have it slightly extended or if you're looking for it to be private. In terms of private, I don't highly recommend, you know, looking at blockchain for your business unless again, you have like multiple stores you're trying to manage. 
Um, so in terms of like spending, a lot of people are hearing about all the costs associated that are going into it, but the biggest spenders in terms of the R&D trying to implement for this technology would be in that banking and finance sector. Um, back in 2019, they spent over a billion dollars uh, researching and looking into this technology. After that, it would be that uh, manufacturing resource sector. They spent a fair bit of money. They were the second largest and they were looking at how can blockchain overcome some of the complex uh, operational challenges, high regulations, you know, how do they create lower cost um, distribution services? So then you'd be looking at, you know, that supply chain. Um, this one's probably in 2020 been a larger spender than even in the banking and finance sector, but they spent about $652 million last year alone. And then public sector governments are starting to pay close attention and starting to do research and uh, put money into it. So it's basically kind of like spending across the board right now on does it work? How's it work for my business? How can it redu reduce costs? How can it reduce redundancies? How can it create better traceability and trustlessness? One of my favorite things about blockchain is actually how it kind of brings companies together because of the fact that you're trying to get multiple parties to the table to agree on similar set of data facts, it means there's a lot of collaboration that needs to happen between businesses and their suppliers and vendors. So now all these really amazing consortiums have started coming up. We have the oil and gas blockchain consortium. They're based out of Houston right now, and they're coming up with some really interesting solutions for the energy sector. We have agriculture based ones. Um, there's more than just IBM Food Trust, uh, but there's quite a few um, uh, consortiums coming together in that egg set sense, um, insurance even. Um, there's about 50 member organization into the risk stream collaborative. And then we have our Canadian blockchain consortium um, and many, many more, but it's, it's a conversation starter. People are interested. They wanna know how to do business better. They wanna know what new emerging technologies are coming up and well, blockchain is yes, it's a buzzword. Once it gets to the point where, you know, say in another 10 years from now, consortiums even like ours won't be as needed because people will have a better understanding, similar to how cloud technology, everyone was curious, what's the cloud? How do we use it? How do we work with it? There were all kinds of groups that were educating and advocating on cloud technologies. Now, people don't even care to know what cloud technologies is. They just know if they're using their Mac, they can connect their phone to their desktop, to their iPad, and they can share all that information in, in the cloud. Um, and it's no longer a buzzword, it's just more of a reality. So when, when things get to the point of mass adoption, this education advocacy that we're doing uh, stops being so imperative. So let's talk about some of the industry case studies. Um, this one's interesting. Uh, oh, we're getting ready for the minute of silence. Um, so I could probably finish this one up first. So this one's kind of interesting uh, with currently what's happening with say like COVID, um, this one's based on kind of like your health records. So what I like about this, it's built on that hyperledger fabric and it actually gives the ownership and the, um, the custodialship of your health data to back to yourself. Because right now when you uh, go to the hospital or you go to a doctor's office and you're giving up that information, it now becomes that clinic, that hospital, that doctor's private information. And you can't share that between multiple different clinics. Okay. Okay, uh, yeah, I will just have a, a minute of uh, silence. Thank you. Okay, Kole, yeah, you, you can begin now. 
Sorry about that. Uh, so as I was saying with this company, it just gives you that ownership of your medical records back and why that would be important. So say, you know, if I'm somebody who's been having health issues and I've gone to multiple different doctors over a 10 year period, I keep getting, you know, um, what I would consider say an inaccurate uh, diagnosis. It has a lot to do with a lack of being able to share and have all your data accumulated into one area. So with this particular app, you no longer have to like go and manually like write down, you know, all the ailments that you've been suffering from. You can have everything of your own data stored within your own app. So when you go to a doctor's office, you're now granting them permission to see your entire record history, right? Um, so in terms of privacy, this app does comply with um, current privacy laws. I believe it's compliant with GDPR, which is, um, one of the more stringent uh, privacies that's coming out right now. Um, again, speed. So you no longer have to go to multiple different doctor's offices trying to reconcile that data and have it shipped to one party. The speed is the fact that it's all compiled within your own app. And in terms of cost, it takes away a lot of that manual administration um, and also that, that redundancy that can create errors in uploading your, your data. So I don't know, I, I've been to hospitals where I have to write on a piece of paper and then the, somebody takes that paper and then they're manually entering it in. There can be a lot of error within um, those two areas. Also, you might not remember symptoms that you had three years ago that could be relevant today, right? So if a doctor sees your entire history, you're able to own that data, you give permission to who you'd like to see that data, it just creates better kind of like self-sovereignty. So I find this app uh, pretty interesting. Another one in terms of healthcare is this one has the ability to show like immutable records for healthcare workers. So say I'm a nurse, maybe I'm not a nurse, I'm pretending to be a nurse, I've doctored a record and I'm going to a hospital and I wanna get a job as a nurse but I'm really actually not qualified. This app is a way for hospitals to verify records of nurses um, based on um, you know, the academic institutions that they got their certificates from. So if you're a nurse um, and you have your certificate, you can upload it into this particular database and they're able to verify it through the academic institution and go, okay, this is somebody who actually has their credentials because the last thing you want is someone who isn't actually like practicing medicine, trying to practice medicine on you. Um, and there's been um, a lot of fraud with that recently. So this is a great app to help prevent that. Uh, another great case study would be with Walmart. So Walmart was one of the ones I was talking about with that kind of value end-to-end -end, uh, supply chain. And after a successful two-year um, pilot that they did, it's now becoming mandatory for Walmart suppliers. So uh, one of the Canadian companies, DLT Labs, just successfully brought all of the logistics companies uh, working with Walmart onto Walmart's blockchain. One of the fascinating things about using something like blockchain in agriculture for supply chain, it has so many different benefits. One is even human health and safety. So they've been able to take their food recall times down from six to seven days to 2.2 seconds. The reason why that is impressive is the fact that previously, say Walmart had a batch of spinach. It had... Um, a salmonella or E. coli, whatever poisoning that was in it, it would take 10 or 15 customers to complain before they recognized it. And then they'd have to go back and recall everything because they have no idea what has actually been tainted. They just know, all right, the spinach is bad. We're going to get into a lawsuit, recall it all. An average lawsuit can cost a company like that 5 million. And on the extreme end, um, it can cost them fifth to a hundred million dollars to recall just one product and then the lawsuits that come out from it. If you're able to do a blockchain for something like this, you could get as specific as, all right, I know that this quadrant of this particular farm using like IOT sensors, right? So you know exactly where this data was collected for this spinach. Then you know exactly where it was transported. You know exactly where it was, you know, cleaned and packaged, you know, what QR codes that batch from that land location came from, you know, what truck it was shipped in, you know, what stores it went to. So now you have precision based accuracy, not having to go back through to, you know, the logistics all the way through the distribution houses and separate again to um, you know, the farmers, right? So you have all these different value chains you'd have to individually manually go back to because you don't share data. 
With sharing data, you no longer need to do that. You can trace it back into its instant origin point, saving companies an incredible amount of money, but also increasing human health and safety. Knowing that it can be recalled with like precision accuracy, you have that better safety and assurance of knowing, all right, the next package of lettuce that I pick up and buy is not going to be tainted with this. Therefore, I, I feel better and safer. So that is one of the, I'd say, stronger use cases in the agriculture sector for uh, using blockchain technology. Um, this one's interesting, again, in supply chain. Um, so it's Honeywell, and I believe Honeywell with this one is actually working with Boeing. Um, and again, things are being built on Hyperledger Fabric. If you're not familiar with Hyperledger, it's IBM's blockchain. Um, and it hosts more than a billion dollars of uh, parts that are for sale. So this company is managing complex supply, uh, supply chains with major cost um, for industry. And this um, blockchain basically is a very powerful tune a tool for streamlining this product tracking and it's facilitating trade in aviation parts. So aviation, um, even though that industry has been hit, is a very, very expensive industry. You're looking at, you know, millions, millions of dollars just to buy a single airplane. And some of the engines, if you're looking to replace that, it's like, well, there's $10 million of a, you know, a bird flew into that plane. So if there is um, planes that have parts that are still good and they're looking to trade with company or any of the aviation the airlines who are like, I need a spare part for this. This is one of those um, platforms that you can use to do it. So secure Providence, go direct purchasing, you know exactly you're assured where is this product coming from? Because for aviation safety and standards, you have to be very, very strict on this. So Providence is key. Instant traceability, buyers and sellers can know exactly where their product is in terms of like shipping and transportation. And then fewer expenses. You're no longer going through a third party intermediary broker. You're able to go direct uh, right to the person who has that part. Um, so it does a couple different things. Um, agriculture. So this is one of the ones I talked about, kind of like that uh, birth to burger, which is really interesting. So this one's called beef chain. So they actually put these little, um, every cow has a tag, but these little tags are actually with RFID and IOT, um, like chips and scanners. So you just like wave um, kind of like a scanner or a wand, whichever it is, it's going to capture the data on this. And what you're able to do is um, track the beef from all the way from like a farm in my Wyoming, all the way to where it is being eaten in Asia. So you can take your phone, you can scan that QR code, you can see the entire history, the complete provenance of it. So it's a consumer-based app. It just, it's millennials, consumers, um, anyone born in 1980 all the way, I think it's to like 2000 and 2000, I think it is. Sorry, I might be inaccurate on that one. But they're much more um, aware of what they're eating. What's in my food? Where did my food come from? Is this humanitarian? All of those kind of things are paramount. And customers are making choices um, to work with companies or to purchase products on companies in a more aware way than they ever have before. Oh. So being able to see this provenance is very key being able to have certified origins. Say you're purchasing a Wagyu piece of meat. You want to know that it's actually Wagyu. You want to know that this has been, you know, grass fed. It's been able to go out to pasture. It's been able to get all its veterinary checks, but it's a premium piece of meat. If you're going to spend that kind of price on it, you want to know that it's actually premium. Um, it also helps to ship, uh, simplify the shipping process um, and all through enhanced RFIDs and tracking. So this is a really nice one in agriculture that's being currently used. Grain chain is another interesting one in agriculture. This again removes that expensive intermediary and allows farmers to trade seeds, uh, which is really fascinating. So it cuts out uh, the red tape and allows their product to get directly to market and has secure digital records of the proof of provenance of, of whatever the, like the seed or the agriculture um, that there's selling and it helps to eliminate the fraud. That's a big one that blockchain helps with. If you've kind of seen the, the theme going through, it helps to create that trust to eliminate um, that fraud. Uh, so this one from Mercedes Benz, uh, this will be kind of like an ongoing project. We're probably gonna see advancing over the next three to five years, but this was more of their kind of like social, social credibility. What they wanted to do was see how they could reduce um, or track emissions reduction 
through the batteries of their electric vehicles. So they're a luxury automobile company, as many would know, and they've taken the lead in developing this uh, blockchain pilot specifically for tracking emissions through their, manu their entire manufacturing supply chain for battery cells. So battery cells are, are very, they're hard to recycle. Um, they're not, act, electric vehicles are not as emissions friendly as um, you would assume they would be based on the fact that you can't do much with that lithium. It's very, very toxic. The lithium mines, um, you can't really do anything once you've, you know, mined out that mine. It's basically just a crater in the earth. Um, there's no possible, there's no proper way to actually recycle uh, lithium batteries at this point. So they're trying to track their emissions through this manufacturing supply chain. And the company is partnered with, um, I believe it's called Circular, and it's a startup that specializes in um, blockchain technology for industrial supply chains. So they're going to start by focusing on this uh, battery cell, and if it's successful, they'll expand to other areas. Um, but I believe that uh, they're looking at becoming carbon neutral within the next 20 years, which requires a very accurate understanding of their entire process and how, how the emissions are produced by developing out their car. Uh, it's a great goal, uh, slightly unrealistic to get carbon neutral, but at least they're, they're on the right track for environmental awareness. Um, so this is a case study. This company is based out of Calgary, Alberta and they're uh, Guild One. So what they've been able to do is help um, in the oil and gas sector. So it's with, um, uh, what is it, balloting. So basically what happens with uh, in oil and gas, if you have multiple different uh, counterparties, and so you have like Husky, you have Nexon, you have a couple of Shell, and they're all taking their oil out of the ground and they're sending it down a pipeline. Um, they end up getting like royalties, right? For how much is how much of that oil, or they pay out royalties to the government for how much has been produced. Um, what can happen there is you can end up with disputes. Well, I say I put in this much. This company is saying I put in this much. This company is saying I put in this much. And because a lot of that work is actually still kind of manually paper entried, it could take up to three months to notice that there could have been a dispute. What this blockchain does is it actually allows to bring that dispute up to the forefront. So in real time, if these three counterparties don't um, agree on the same set of facts, they're able to resolve that dispute to get those royalty payments out quicker through. Um, and then they have another application in terms of balloting, uh, which is a very manually intensive and very paper driven pro process. This is like a smart contract. It helps to self execute on these particular agreements and creates um, you know, a lot less internal disputes. So uh, next one, so this one, e-commerce. A lot of people wouldn't have seen this for um, the travel industry. This one's really fascinating because I believe that, uh, yeah, so $83 billion in consumer spend in the travel industry. This is definitely not what's happened this year. <laughs> um, a lot of people we haven't been able to travel, but we're looking at last year, like so 2019 numbers. That's a lot of money in consumer spending that goes into the travel industry and travel agents. Um, so you have, uh, say your, what is it? Travelocity and, and Expedia.ca, some of those like third party intermediaries that bring all of these different hotels or flights or car rentals into one kind of concise app to show consumers, oh, here's the lowest cost. But they get um, a commission for every, everyone that uses their site that goes directly to say Avis, they have to get paid out a commission for, you know, Avis purchasing some or someone purchasing an Avis product through that site. But because of the fact that, um, again, this is kind of like a manual style of, of doing things, it can also take a long time to actually get, um, get that commission up to say 90 days. And you know, most businesses, you wanna be able to receive that income and in, say like real time. So if a consumer makes a purchase on an expensive product, and that reconciliation um, has to happen, it can take a while to reconcile through that company. But if you're using something like a blockchain, once that person has stayed in that hotel, has paid that fee or has taken that flight, it can reconcile instantaneously and allow for um, 
that that e-commerce site or, or that uh, travel agency site to actually get paid quicker in real time. So it helps to digitize this process. It helps to make it a lot faster. It also helps with tracking. So say someone's like, yeah, I absolutely want to take this flight and something happens where they had to cancel right, but they still end up paying for it. So uh, like say WestJet didn't offer them a refund because it was purchased through this site, right? Um, Cause you've seen that happens and it turns into a site credit that has to also uh, get reconciled as well. So things like tracking are, are really amazing for this. Oops. There we go. So what are some of the obstacles and opportunities? Um, so in terms of like business value, it has a very proven track record of operational um, cost reduction. It's demonstrated an ability to track products. It has smart contracts that can streamline the uh, transaction process. Some of the challenges, um, getting it into a large scale, it involves a large number of counterparties and you know, human beings who don't always agree on things. Um, market, the market currently offers a lot of competing products, so it's very difficult to know what product you want to actually work with and go to. And particularly in the financial services sector, there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty involving uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, so in terms of future development, a lot to do with business optimizations. Um, a lot has come up in the last five years, so that ability to optimize your business systems and create cost savings efficiencies. Um, what that could mean for firms in the near in the future could generate uh, 3.1 trillion in new business value by 2030. So that's a lot of value uh, for businesses. So some of the other future development would be uh, digital synergies. So IoT and machine learning I see as very complementary uh, technologies. If you're looking at putting information into a blockchain, um, generally you're going to need IoT. You're going to need to capture that data somehow. And then if, you're, if you've already captured a lot of data, you're gonna to wanna to know what data do you wanna put into a blockchain, especially if it's immutable and traceable, you want only the accurate information that, that's in there. So you might wanna learn, use machine learning to tag and scrub and clean off that data before it actually goes into a, a blockchain. So that's my presentation. I hope uh, you guys found this interesting. I know we have, I think I went over by about two minutes, but um, if you guys have any questions, happy to answer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kolea. There, there, there's some discussion going on in the chat box and there, there are already some uh, questions. Uh, maybe instead of like passing the mic around, there are some questions which are already there in the chat box. Uh, maybe we can start with that. Okay. So there's Three one minutes. on, there's a couple on, on, on regulation and the role of the government. So there's the one on who regulates and monitors blockchain, what is the role of the government and how do uh, governments uh, regulate the transaction in order to collect tax. Okay, so this isn't an enterprise level blockchain question. This is a cryptocurrency blockchain question. Mm -hmm. um, so who regulates monitors blockchain? Um, it's so let's let's just go for bit. let's I'm going to explain Bitcoin. This is the easiest way to do it. So who regulates and monitors Bitcoin? No one is completely decentralized. There is no single point of authority. There's no point of origin that you can track and trace back and try and regulate. It is, can, it is unable to be regulated in terms of Bitcoin's blockchain. The role of government, there is uh, currently no role that government can take in terms of trying to regulate Bitcoin. What they're trying to do right now is regulate the on and off ramps. So if I'm a digital exchange, um, if I'm a trading platform, they're going to regulate that trading platform because they cannot regulate the cryptocurrency side. It's too anonymous. Uh, it's too difficult currently to track and trace to who's actually running and owning and controlling it. Bitcoin has no one that controls it. There's other ones like Ethereum, uh, which you can go back and figure out like who exactly created that one, but it's now considered uh, not a security, which is fascinating. But the government's role right now is they're trying to regulate those on and off ramps. They're trying to regulate who actually takes custody of it. So if I'm giving an exchange my money and I'm converting it into a digital currency, I'm trading that digital currency and I'm trying to take that money back off that exchange, the exchange is now considered a custodian. And based on being a custodian, they also count in the derivatives market. And based on that, there's a hyper amount of regulation that comes in. You need IROC, you need CSA, depending on the region that you're in. If you're in Alberta, you need the ASC. 
and if you're in BC, you need the BCSC. So that's what governments are doing. Um, but in terms of regulates and monitors blockchain, you're not speaking of a enterprise level blockchain because again, governments are not able to regulate something that's a, a private business's database. That would be highly unethical. But in the financial market, um, if they're trying to protect the consumer, uh, then they would be trying to find that way, but only on the on off ramp. They don't have the current ability to do anything further. Um, right, I'm just going to quickly jump in just to add a little bit more to what, what Kalea was saying. I think <clears throat> regarding the question that came up, I think it came from Wudu. To be very clear, if it's a private level software that you're using, if it's a platform that you're using between your own suppliers, your own supply chain, government really has no role in it, right? It's basically the people who are working and using that system that are using it to verify transactions among themselves. Government really has no function in it whatsoever. Just like if you're using a a payroll software or any other software in your business, this the government has no function whatsoever. What Kalia is talking about now, which we'll talk about next week is around specifically on cryptocurrencies, because now this is butting against the role that government has in issuing uh, tender fiat currencies, et cetera. There are lots of questions regarding regulation there. And I think that's where the contention will come into play. If there's stuff that's happening on your private platform and Walmart is moving things around or tracking things, there's no really, question of taxes, you're paying taxes in the normal way. This is just helping you with the traceability and the tracking of a product throughout your, uh, your supply chain. And then I think there's a question from, from Gord Clear asking specifically about smart contracts. Um, which question is that? Can you explain smart contract. more about uh, smart contracts? how blockchain helps create smart contracts? Um, okay, so basically it's, so when you're, when you, so when you'd normally go to a lawyer, so, so you know, like have Law Depot out there right now, how you can go and you have all these uh, templates that are already there. You plug in the data that you want in that template and then you can get someone to execute on that other side of that, that contract or an agreement. Right now, Law Depot has made, you know, being able to get a legal contract more accessible, cheaper, easier, where you don't have, unless it's, a, there are certain things that you should definitely go to a lawyer for. So I'm not highly recommending Law Depot here, um, but just to lead into my example. So a lot of contracts are already templated. So if you program into a system, right? So say uh, I'm trying to work with, um, a contractor, I'm building my house. We can go in and pre-program into an existing blockchain system and say, all right, it's a, I'm purchasing a home. They have to purchase all these supplies uh, for me to execute and pay for this home. Um, X, Y, and Z has to be fulfilled. So both counterparties are agreeing on what constitutes a legal agreement to be able to be executed. So there is definitely work up front, right? You want to know exactly who you're working with. You want to know what all the stipulations are. You want to know every the, the amount of money that's going to be involved. But what happens when you put it up into the system and you, and you decide all of your parameters? So say me as the person with the money, I have to verify on my end through the bank and in a record through this blockchain that now I have this money sitting in my account and the second that the other counterparty validates that they've completed the work, all of a sudden the contract is going to self-execute. So it doesn't mean we now have to come back to the table. They don't have to wait 30, 60, 90 days to get paid. Um, as long as they did their job accurately and I feel satisfied with the work, the contract self-executes. So on the contractor side, they would likely have to show um, a couple of different things. One, that they have the materials, the home has been built, an inspection has been performed, a third party has validated uh, this person's work, that information gets put up into the blockchain and once it meets all of those metrics, that contract self-executes and finalizes. So it doesn't mean that it takes it 100% of the work. Uh, this thing, it, it's not going to be able to read anyone's mind. You will still have to know exactly what contract you're entering into. There will be a bit of a process getting it into that system. The point is that it's going to continually self-execute. So 
say you have metrics where it's like, I want updates that when you're 30% complete, 60% complete, 90% complete, 100% complete, that contractor has to upload that data to make sure that at every milestone is being met, he's fulfilling his obligations. This is where trustlessness is not, uh, trustlessness is created. You no longer have to trust what someone individually is telling you, you're able to see and track that on your own through the blockchain. So I hope that kind of helps. Um, so I'm not sure where the questions are exactly. Um, I think we're just going to open it up a little bit more. If people have any questions, if you want to just quickly raise your hand or if you want to type them in. And Gord was sort of just, just doing a bit of a follow-up. He was saying, so in, you know, in his particular case, he could use blockchain to check if his contractor who were to do, um, you know, the building of a house yes. was, uh, was meeting all the conditions along the way, right? So every time they, for example, they Absolutely. lay the foundation. So you're you able to a... go in and trace it and check it in real time. Um, so right. in other words, like you can, you get like a little message on your computer, say you have like auto alerts and it's like contractor uploaded this data. It's like, oh, great. It's usually gonna come with pictures or, you know, um, home inspect, whatever the files are, whatever you've asked for to make sure that you feel you're going to be able to get your money's worth to pay for that good service home, whatever it is, you're going to be able to track and verify that data without having to ask. You're just going to be able to see. Oh, yeah. And in the course, we were just talking about block rice from Cambodia, where they're using it in organic rice. And, you know, once the farmer delivers a certain volume of organic rice with the right quality at the right date at the right time, automatically the payment is made to the farmer. So similar principle where if those preconditions that you've established have been met, the payment is automatic. Yeah. I think one example that you shared, Kalea, about uh, about Africa, I think that was that was quite, um, that could be quite revolutionary in terms of uh, the land uh, titles. I think some time back, uh, um, the economist uh, Hernando de Soto, he calculated the, the total value of the unregistered assets that poor people have. And the total value in 2000, the year 2000, I think was over $9 trillion of the assets that poor people have, but nothing of that has been documented. So a technology like this can allow people to, uh, but, but for this, this to actually happen in terms of the hardware, the software, the regulatory mechanisms, what needs to happen? And, and when do you see this will, uh, materialize five, 10 years? So let's just like look at Canada uh, when, we, when we look at this question. So right now, let's look at the indigenous land. If, right, if the government came in, if there, say there was a, um, let's just say First Nations, for example, they, they have an area or a border where this is their land. But the government comes in and says, you know what, I want to build another railroad and it's going to go through your land and we're just going to take this because we have legal precedent because it's Canadian, you know, land now, and we're letting you use what was your land. So we'll go in and like take a chunk of land and use it for infrastructure or say whatever it is. Now, if there's no like specific land title that designates for like First Nations, it's like, no, this is absolutely my land. If you want to take it, you have to pay for it. There's no legal precedent that allows you to come in. It's not unclaimed territory. It's not unclaimed land. What would need to happen is actually the government to work alongside this. So you have land titles. So right now, if I want to go like change a land title, that's a very onerous paperwork process, All right? So I'd have to go into a location. I'd have to prove my little deed. I'd have to get them to update the title. And all of that can now be done through like blockchain. It can be done automatically. Right, so if government says, all right, you, um, even though you've been here for many, 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 many generations, you have absolutely no paperwork, we're going to issue you out a, a, a deed. So you're gonna need land surveyors to go and scope that section. You're going to need land titles to issue out that land title. You're going to need government to agree that you have ownership of that land. So there's multiple different counterparties that have to come. Lawyers are gonna to have to get involved because now you're dealing with legal contracts and. Um, so it's, it's not a simple process, unfortunately, it's the type of process that needs to happen because, you know, not in, in Canada, we do have 
a lot better of an opportunity to know who has what, but there actually is a project called the Thunderbird Consensus where they're working with the Grand Chief of Saskatchewan and Calgary through the Thunderbird Consensus of actually being able to give individual uh, Aboriginals their deeds to their land. Because right now it's just kind of like, you know, a mass plot of land that's being, um, you know, owned by like say Treaty Chief or, or this particular tribe. But what they're trying to do is give individual ownership. Um, it's almost like giving over a squatter's right. It's like you've been in this home or in this part of land for so long, but you have no title to it. So this consensus is working with land titles, working with government, working with the indigenous to be able to actually execute and give out titles to the individual owners of that land on that, you know. Um, in third, in other countries around the world, like say that example in Africa, I know they've piloted that project already. I'd, I'd have to go back through and find out exactly what company and what part of Africa, forgive me, this is about a year ago that I read it. But the fact that they were able to speed that up by what, uh, almost 100% being able to deliver out, you know, more than double what they were able to in that year. The problem for them is cost, the cost of that software, the cost of that infrastructure, the cost of, you know, being able to get like, you know, the computers and everything else, the, the land surveyors, that's onerous. And if the government doesn't have the money to be able to support this liquidity, uh, or, or support being able to get this uh, transaction done, that would definitely be a barrier. What it would do though, for say, if I'm a, a mom and I've been you know, living on this property for a very long time, if I have a deed to this property, I can actually go get something like a micro loan. I could be able to go and get a little bit of funding from the bank to be able to start my own business, be it sewing, be it agriculture and farming, be it beadwork, whatever, whatever it is, because I have proof of my own land, I have something that the bank considers valuable, I can go and get money. That's the most to me valuable thing that um, blockchain and land titles could offer to struggling families in third world countries, value, tangible real world value based on an asset that banks or lenders would consider to have, you know, actual value. So that trillions that could be opened up is trillions of dollars in circulation because land is a scarce resource. And as long as you, you know, if you have land, that means you have access to money and liquidity. So it would not be a cheap process. It would not be a slow process, but um, governments are looking at it because they do see the value because one of the things they can do is now tax your land. And of course, government wants to tax you. So <laughs> they can prove that you are sitting on that land. They can tax you for that land. Thank you, Kalea. I think we're almost at time. Uh, any, any concluding thoughts uh, uh, from your side, Farooq, before we close? No, I, I think that was great. I, I just wanted to mention the, the example that uh, Kalia mentioned from Africa is actually from Kenya, which is where I'm from originally. And it's the Land Landby Group. They've been trying to do this pilot with the Kenya Lands Registry. Okay. Uh, you know, you're, you're completely upsetting the status quo where there is a lot of corruption. There are lots of issues in terms of how, um, you know, the, the land title and land uh, title security has been a challenge for since independence. Uh, so a, a company coming in and trying to improve the transparency in this is uh, running into a lot of regulatory roadblocks. But if they're able to get the traction, it will fundamentally change how you do that. I'm just thinking of another example. You know, in most countries in Africa, when you have to transfer your car from one individual to the other, they still have a physical piece of paper, which is called a logbook. And it will tell you physically written who the car belonged to, at what point was the car sold to somebody else. And every time you need to do the transfer, you need to go back to the government to do this. And every time you need to go and get this stamp, that stamp that needs to go into that piece of paper is where the opportunities for corruption exist. If you had a way in which you could now start using blockchain to pr provide a full traceability of the ownership of a used car, it automatically reduces a lot of the, the extra friction and the, the challenges that uh, a simple transaction uh, should uh, should uh, should should uh, should be done thank you thank you thank you Kalea. i mean uh, our executive director just wrote uh, in a chat back the um, chat box that you were able to take a very complicated subject and break it down to uh, bit-sized chunks that are understandable 
and I would just echo that. I think you were so succinct and, and with your pra very practical examples of how this technology is being applied right now and also the potential that you talked about. I think it's amazing. So thank you very much for your time, uh, Kolea. Uh, both Farooq and I really appreciate uh, your time. And, and we hope uh, 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 this, this collaboration and we can bring you in, in some other time as well. And, and next time we will talk about your, your role and how you are getting women into, uh, to use this technology. Maybe that, that will be the topic of our next, next webinar when we can get to you. Oh, that Thanks. would be lovely. I love talking about that. Well, thank you all very, very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak here today and I hope you guys have an amazing class. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Do, you, and, do we want to just take a minute where people can turn on the video so you can see where we are around the world? Yeah. Great, yeah. She, she's been talking to a blank screen for, for the last little while. So it'll be nice for her to kind of see some faces. Yeah, so we have uh, uh, at least uh, 13, 14 countries uh, represented here. And, and I think for these global technologies, uh, when we talk about these global technologies, it's important to have a global audience like this just to understand the, the implications, the opportunities and challenges. Thank you. So this will be uh, posted, um, obviously in our class, I will post this in, in the Moodle as soon as the class ends. And for the outside uh, crowd, this will be posted on our Cody's YouTube channel. Thank you very much. And, and to our class participants, uh, please watch out your email. Uh, there'll be a different link that uh, we will use for the next class, okay? So please, please uh, look, uh, watch out for my email for next session. It will be at the same yeah. time. One other thing very quickly to add as well is we will put the presentation for this week up on Moodle. We will unlock the reading resources for next week. So we encourage you to look through them. We have some exciting speakers coming in next week. We'll talk a little bit about that. And of course, we'll complete the discussion on cryptocurrencies as well. So please make sure you get through the required resources. There's some cool things in there we want you to see, read, and, uh, and listen to. Thanks again, everyone, and see you next week. Same time, same place. Thank you. Bye.